Moto, my name is Kara Kennedy, and I will be chairing the second session of today's uh, Intersectional Feminist Conference on Reproductive Rights, Healthcare, and Wellbeing. And I'd like to introduce our panelists. First one is Linda Penno. She's a lawyer and company director by professional background and a women's sexual and reproductive health and rights advocate by passion. Since 1997, she's been a board member of the Family Planning Association of New Zealand it's president from 2005 to 2009 and is currently its immediate past president. Linda has recently ended a six-year tenure as a board member of the World Governing Council of the International Planned Parenthood Federation, IPPF, headquartered in London. IPPF works in 170 countries and it's the second largest non-governmental organization in the world. It's the only global NGO focused exclusively on, exclusively on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Linda was a member of the Governing Council in 2008 that promulgated IPPF's policy working group. She was also a member of the Regional Council, Regional Executive Council, and Treasurer of the East and Southeast Asia and Oceania region of IPPF. She has chaired various task force on governance issues at the regional level, and her involvement in the region has also seen her working in countries as diverse as Mongolia, Solomon Islands, and Myanmar. Back in Christchurch, Linda is a former trustee and chair of the trust that runs the World Buskers Festival. She's a founding director and employment law specialist at Johnson Penn Limited, a Christchurch-based employment law and employment relations firm. She's a graduate of U University of Otago. God help it if you explain. <laughs> <laughs> with a Bachelor of Laws and a Bachelor of Arts, majoring in politics and women's medical health history. She's so ancient, her study happened at a time when feminist studies was only just being recognized as a field of academic endeavor. <laughs> and her talk today is entitled, She's Asking For It, Why Abortion Should Be Decriminalized. And I'm going to introduce everyone. <laughs> uh, next we have Mojo Mathers, who's a New Zealand politician and a member of the New Zealand House of Representatives. She's been a senior policy advisor to the Green Party of Aotearoa, New Zealand since 2006 and has stood for the party in the last three general elections. Her candidacy for the 2011 election created significant media interest due to her high placing on the Green Party's list. She was elected to the 50th term of parliament, becoming the country's first deaf member of parliament. Mojo has an honors degree in mathematics and a master's degree in conservation forestry. Um, next, we have Kelly Poe, uh, who's a Christchurch-based mental health advocate, activist, and peer worker. Following her experiences with a mental illness diagnosis as a teenager and subsequent use of youth and adult mental health services, she's become a passionate advocate for service and societal improvement and the involvement of people who use services in these aims. Since beginning work in the mental health field, Kelly has worked in peer support, research, youth residential care, systemic advocacy, and in a youth consumer advisory role to the Christchurch District Health Board, the Mental Health Foundation, Mental Health Commission, and national workforce development organizations. Youth well-being is a particular passion for her, and she identifies as a feminist, socialist, and PWLE, or person with lived mental health experience. Um, the fourth person uh, who is supposed to come today, Karen Saunders, unfortunately, uh, due to illness, she won't be able to be with us, but in her place, we have Daphne Lawless, who's a Fight Back member who's flown down from Auckland to attend, and now she is going to step in. Uh, she's agreed to speak uh, last minute, so we thank her for that. And she has a PhD in English, which is great because I'm doing a PhD in English too, so I think that's an awesome qualification to be a feminist. So without further ado, we have Linda Penno. Thank you, Cara, and um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's um, it's always great for family planning um, to be out and about in the community because we are a, a, well, a community-based organisation. Um, although, listening as well to the panel this morning on intersectional feminism, it's, it's very interesting to me around those sometimes tensions and challenges that can happen um, when organisations come from, from an origin of perhaps um, privilege and, and whiteness. So, um, these are things that as an organisation, family planning um, is certainly challenging itself on now and um, I imagine for a long time to come. I think it's probably appropriate that it's dead on high noon because um, the, the theme of my talk is that in 2015, 
the abortion law in New Zealand should reach its high noon and um, in my view should basically be given a, a, a thorough overhaul. Just to explain a little bit um, about where my standpoint comes from, for me, feminism principally means a focus around bodily sovereignty. Without being empowered, we can't achieve bodily autonomy, and without bodily autonomy, we're unable to enjoy sexual and reproductive health. Without sexual and reproductive health, we face even higher barriers to living the lives we wish for and fulfilling our personal, social, economic, and pol political potential. So I believe that it's a basic right of everyone to have control over their fertility, to decide freely on all issues relating to their sexual and reproductive health, including whether or not to have children, the number and spacing of children if they do so. I believe that the health status of everybody in society is enhanced when reliable methods of fertility management are available, including contraception and uninhibited access to legal, safe abortion. I believe also that a supportive legal environment is necessary for everyone to be able to exercise their reproductive rights, including access to safe and legal termination. So from that standpoint, sexual and reproductive health and rights, for me, is a non-divisible phrase, because nowhere do I believe the ideas of power and control over women are more profoundly concentrated than in the areas of contraception and abortion. And in the work that I've done internationally as well, um, there's certainly a common theme that's run um, through the, the number of very diverse countries that I've come from, or been to. So today I want to focus on abortion, and specifically decriminalising abortion. So just a little bit of history about abortion law in New Zealand. Um, abortion has been classified as a crime in New Zealand since 1866 and shockingly is still a crime under the Crimes Act. Um, perhaps in this audience um, that doesn't come as a surprise but um, I find often if I do ask the question of people out and about, um, they tend, men, men, women alike tend to have um, no idea that abortion is a crime in New Zealand. So when we go on the international stage, when we talk about how proud we can be of some of our achievements that we should have credit for, this is one area where, to be frank, it's embarrassing and, in my view, is a disgrace. So, um, despite, the, <coughs> despite abortion being um, governed by the Crimes Act, even when the Crimes Act was reviewed in 1961, there were no changes made to um, its status as a crime. And um, that's even, even though the United Kingdom, where obviously we take a lot of our legislation from, in 1967, they even passed a more liberal law, but still when we had an opportunity to do something about it, we didn't as early as 1960. At the end of that decade, court cases in Australia gave a more liberal interpretation to state laws about what was lawful. And um, ironically, that gave an avenue for New Zealand women to be able to access abortions in Australia. So women with means were able to go there. And some of you may remember um, some of the more ancient ones amongst us might remember the old SOS um, campaign where women with means donated money so that um, women without means could afford to um, fly to Australia to have an abortion. In 1974, reflecting changes in medical and public opinion, the Auckland Medical Aid Centre opened up to carry out abortions in a private facility. Um, so you might think that was a great thing, and indeed it was. However, in the same year, the clinic was raided and police seized about 500 files. The Court of Appeal ruled that the search warrant had been invalid, but the files were used to bring the operating doctor, Dr Jim Woolno, to trial on 12 counts of procuring unlawful abortions. His defence was that he held an honest belief that there was a danger to the physical or mental health of the 12 women concerned, and he was eventually acquitted. The clinic closed in December 1977 as a result of the Contraception, Sterilisation and Abortion Act, or what I'll refer to after this as the CSMA Act, and it didn't reopen until August 1979 um, after a legal battle to obtain a licence under the CSMA Act. 
Due to intense public debate, a Royal Commission of Inquiry on Contraception, Sterilisation and Abortion was established by the Labour Government under Prime Minister Rowling. That six-member commission uh, was appointed in June 1975 and deliberated for 21 months and eventually in 1977 published its report and that was published to great shock, horror and moral panic as um, all over the country people despaired of the things that they were hearing about in that report. Sadly, um, the findings of the report were very conservative but also very controversial. So that same year, 1977, was when the CSNA Act um, was passed. It um, amended the Crimes Act and seven other acts, including the Guardianship Act, which related to girls under 16 years of age being able to make a decision in their own right. The new procedures for obtaining an abortion came into effect on the 1st of April 1978 under the supervision of a new body, the Abortion Supervisory Committee. The new legislation, right from the word go, proved pretty unworkable. Many women still had to travel to Australia for an abortion. Due to public concern, the Abortion Supervisory Committee recommended changes to the Crimes Act, with fetal abnormality included as a ground, and the deletion of the phrase, and the danger cannot be averted by any other means, in the Act. Um, the procedures also had to include that a surgeon first signed off his or her um, consent to um, agree to operate. During the 80s, an anti-abortionist, Dr Melvin Wall of New Plymouth, challenged the decision of two certified consultants who had authorised an abortion for a young girl. He lost, and the Court of Appeal confirmed that he had no standing to represent the fetus. So, so for groups who oppose abortion, um, this is the start of what you see, and is still ongoing, a, um, a theme of litigation which tries to attack the very technical aspects of the CSNA Act and it's, it's one of the things that it, it's, it's such wasted litigation in the sense of um, the arguments are, are, are very tiny, very finely formed and they really are a symptom of the fact that the CSNA Act um, does, does, just does not sit with where a lot of people um, uh, want to live their lives and should be entitled to live their lives. In the 1980s, both Marilyn Waring and Helen Clark tried to liberalise the law, but they were defeated. Um, it, I guess the only, there is no good thing about that, but um, the only bit of equality in the 80s was that Doug Kidd, who tried for an even more restrictive law, was also defeated. So, um, nil to everybody on that front. <clears throat> also in that decade, and in the 90s, anti-abortionists tried via trespass cases to represent the fetus, but as with the earlier case, um, those, those cases also failed. Um, but you know, they were, they were very, if we just forget about statistics and themes and topics and think about what some of their actions did uh, during the 80s um, with those trespass cases, is to think about the stories of the women who they attacked. And there was one case that I was involved in, in Dunedin, where, um, an opponent of abortion would, um, in fact she did it at Christmas time, so she dressed, dressed up as Father Christmas so that she could get access into the um, gyne gynaecology ward um, because they recognised her otherwise and she knew she wouldn't be allowed in. Got in there, took off the Father Christmas, um, chained herself to, to a bed and started um, verbally abusing um, the woman who was, who was in there. And um, so always at the centre of these things are the stories of the women who have been terribly um, <coughs> treated and harmed by um, the actions of, of people like that particular um, anti-abortion activist. <clears throat> In 2003 came a, a case dealing with early medical abortion. This is, this is abortion via pills where the High Court said that women must take the medications in a licensed facility but you don't need to stay there in between taking the two sets of tablets 48 hours apart. Now again, you see, that's a prime example of where the court again is being asked to rule on a question which is kind of unanswerable under the Act because of course it, was, it came about at a time when surgical abortion was the only available means of having one. So it just simply doesn't talk to the technology that's available now. In 2012, the Supreme Court reversed an earlier decision and affirmed 
just on another sort of tangent, that ACC was obliged to pay for the cost of an abortion following rape. So again, that the inconsistencies and contradictions in the Act you do see appearing in decisions where even though it's still a crime, ACC is told you must pay for that abortion because it was um, an accident under the um, ACC legislation in terms of it being uh, the outcome of a rape. In 2012, a long-running case started in 2005 between Right to Life New Zealand and the Abortion Supervisory Committee finally came to a conclusion in an appeal heard by five judges of the Supreme Court. The hearing was in March of 2012 and um, what that was about was Ken Orr of Right to Life New Zealand claimed that the Abortion Supervisory Committee was not fulfilling its statutory functions and consequently abortions were being approved in circumstances in which they should not be permitted. The appeal was dismissed by a majority decision of 3 to 2. Right to Life also has um, other ongoing litigation um, in front of the courts, but um, I think it's been public, well, has been publicly reported that um, they have a funding issue now, which, which is interesting because they have for a long time been, as I understand it, very well funded, but um, it seems now that they owe their lawyers a lot of money and um, they have got an issue with um, where they're getting their funds from. So what's the legal situation today? After all this time, the two governing statutes are still the Crimes Act and the CSNA Act. Termination is unlawful unless the criteria which make it lawful are met. And those criteria are set out in the Crimes Act and are serious danger to life, serious danger to physical health, serious danger to mental health, any form of incest or sexual relations with a guardian, and you're going to love this next one, mental subnormality also fetal abnormality. Other factors which are not grounds in themselves but which are taken into account are extremes of age and sexual violation. After 20 weeks gestation the grounds are stricter and it must be necessary to save the life of the woman or prevent serious permanent injury to her physical or mental health. So you can see the layers and layers and layers of um, prescription around the actual criteria and in a moment I'm going to talk about what that then means in terms of the actual procedures because that complexity is mirrored in what you have to do to, um, to, to get an abortion today. Uh, um, because of the criminal status of um, the scheme of, of the, the Act, um, the two minutes, I can't believe it. Okay, <laughs> right. So, because of that complexity, there's all of these hoops that you have to go through. And, um, and so what you need to do is um, basically go to your GP or a family planning doctor. You then you have to have a, um, two certifying consultants saying it's okay for you to have an abortion. And um, then you either opt for a surgical abortion or an EMA, which is the early medical abortion by taking pills. Now, um, one of the issues around this long, complicated process is, of course, the clock is ticking the whole way. And um, that, that has a huge impact, clearly, on the gestation age. And um, as any clinician will tell you, the earlier an abortion can be performed, the, the even safer it is for, um, for the woman concerned. So, why we need abortion law reform um, can broadly, I think, be summarised in five ways, six ways actually. Access is impeded. Um, geographically, there's inconsistent access across New Zealand. Um, there are no services available on the West Coast, Rotorua, Whanganui, Palmerston North and South Canterbury, so travel is required. So um, you can imagine, particularly if you're young and or poor, how are you going to get to somewhere else? How are you going to explain your absence? You're away from your usual um, support systems. Only 57% of abortions in New Zealand are performed under 10 weeks gestation. Just to give you one comparison, 80% in the UK occur under 10 weeks. So that's all to do with this unwieldy process that you have to go through, and that's a disgrace. Secondly, why we need abortion law reform. Um, the current law stigmatises abortion. To put it bluntly, it turns us, we women, into criminals and requires those seeking an abortion to convince at least two doctors that they meet the legal grounds. 
while abortion is overwhelmingly provided on mental health grounds, 97.6% in 20,000, people in New Zealand should not have to claim significant mental health issues to access health care. They should be entitled to make their own decision um, based on support, expert advice and counselling. Um, stigma, shame and even harassment can prevent people getting the information and support that they need around having an abortion and the, the Abortion Supervisory Committee noted in 2014 that many still face verbal abuse when entering hospital facilities to have an abortion. Thirdly, it's costly and outdated. The current system costs about $4 million in fees to certifying consultants. <clears throat> the 40-year-old law has also not kept up with social norms or medical technology and because it was written before early medical abortion was available. Fourthly, it treats women as criminals and a health service as a crime. As a result, it puts reproductive decision making in the hands of the state and its ag agents, instead of those decisions being made freely by individuals, couples or families, based on informed choice. You know, we, we trust women to be Prime Ministers, Chief Justices, Governors General, but somehow or other we think we can't be trusted to make our own decisions about our own health care. Fifthly, New Zealand is out of step, I'm probably out, also out of time, with international <laughs> trends, um, an increasing number of countries are decriminalising abortion. Between 1997 and 2008, the grounds on which abortion may be legally performed were broadened in 17 countries, and those are countries as diverse as Benin, Cambodia, Chad, Guinea, Iran, Mali, Nepal, Niger, San Lucia, and Switzerland. Where's New Zealand? Well, we certainly aren't there. It's a disgrace. Sixthly, the law simply does not reflect the reality of women's lives. Neither does it put women's rights and health at the centre of reproductive services. And if we consider that on some data we have a fertile life of around 45 years, it's not surprising that somewhere along the line um, there will be an unintended pregnancy or pregnancies. So for once and for all, let's put the health and rights of women at the centre of reproductive services so that we can have, in Hillary Clinton's words, safe, legal and rare abortion. So let's start by getting abortion decriminalised. Mm -hmm.